All right. Well, hey, welcome uh, to a little couch conversation we're having over here at Philippi Church in Grants Pass. Um, uh, we are going to have a conversation today about eschatology, and we'll talk about what that means here in a few minutes. But uh, before we do that, uh, let's just ask God to bless our time together, and let's do introductions. Uh, Father, we're grateful for the opportunity you've given us today, uh, each one of us. God, you've given us time in our schedule and the opportunity to have this discussion with our Bibles open as we look to the last things. Pray, God, that uh, you would guide this conversation by your Spirit, that you would be glorified in these conversations, and this would be helpful to us and to Philippi Church and to Heritage Christian Fellowship. We give this time to you, God. Uh, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so we got four of us here on the couches. Uh, we're going to have a discussion, but before we just jump in, I think it'd be really cool for everyone to get to know who's here. So why don't we just do a brief introductions? Dave, you're the one guy who's sort of an outsider, not from the area. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? We'll kind of just go on down the line. Yeah, my name's uh, Dave Cartwright. I met Paul back in 2017 at Epicos Church. We both worked there, and we've maintained a, a friendship since then. Uh, back in the day, I studied at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Uh, I currently work for an organization called the Charles Simeon Trust. Uh, it's a parachurch ministry that helps train uh, pastors and, and Bible teachers and expository preaching. Awesome. Uh, my name is Mike Robinson. I'm uh, one of the elders at Heritage, uh, I'm president of Pacific Bible College, and teach theology as well as uh, or eschatology as well as man, sin, salvation, and have been doing that for for longer than I want to admit, a couple <laughs> couple decades now. So that's awesome. I'm Paul. I'm uh, I'm a pastor at Heritage Christian Fellowship. Uh, been in been in Southern Oregon for three and a half years. Before that, I pastored in the state of Wisconsin for about twenty years, and I uh, just feel honored to be a part of this conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My name's Sam, and I pastor here at Philippi, and do the majority of the preaching. And uh, we started this church about almost five years ago, hmm. and uh, wow. we're still here. So praise five God. Five years. Yeah. It's been close to five years. Wow. Yeah, wow. I still remember you leading worship for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's weird how we gave an introduction of ourselves and everybody had that moment of like, oh, where is the time gone? <laughs> yeah, 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 no yeah. doubt. Um, you know, we I was I've been sharing this with anyone who will listen, but <laughs> we talk about at Heritage about how we have an open handed eschatology. And, and we want to, uh, you know, we believe that there are some essential things that we need to hold to, some essential doctrines that we cannot divide over, that we actually should die over. But we believe there's secondary doctrines, especially when it comes to the area of eschatology, where we need to have an open-handed approach. And so kind of, as I was sharing with you guys before we started recording, the, the hope here today is that we can have an open-ended conversation with our Bibles open, uh, a theological conversation, uh, but also a practical conversation about what is eschatology? Why is it important? What should we believe and think about this as Christians? How does it pertain to our lives as we seek to walk with Jesus? But at the end of the day, we're hoping to really model a discussion, just a, a humble, spirit-led, uh, mutually respectful discussion in areas where we agree, and also probably in some areas where we disagree. And so kind of in part, why we're doing this is just to model that open-handedness in this area, but also we want this to be a helpful resource to our people, to our churches, especially Heritage and Philippi, that's our audience here. We want our people to be able to have some meaningful some meaningful truth, some meaningful meat to, to chew upon as we kind of journey through, our churches have been journeying through the apocalyptic uh, nature of Daniel chapters 7 through 12, and this just kind of goes in line with what we've been talking about. And so today, was kind of, it's kind of a dream to have this conversation uh, and just see where the, the Spirit... We're trying not to script this too much. We have a couple questions we've scripted, but, but honestly, we're just allowing God to lead this conversation wherever it goes. And um, hopefully no one gets in uh, fistfights, but hopefully it ends up to be a very civil and wonderful conversation. So all that being said, I, I just want to ask that, that first opening question simply... You know, beyond just eschatology, why is it important for Christians to have respective, respectful theological discussion, even if there's disagreement that happens in those discussions? It's a question for all. Uh, I'll start. I think uh, it the the adage "iron sharpens iron." Mm -hmm. uh, we all have broken minds. We all have mm -hmm. misconceptions. We all have. Uh, things that we think about wrongly when it comes to life, the human experience, Christianity, etc. And when we get to share uh, with another Christian the same worldview, the same faith, the same understanding of the human experience, mm. we begin to get some reflections of somebody else's perspective. And so truth and the Holy Spirit have an opportunity to break down our misconceptions, and hopefully through that interaction both persons or the group uh, have a closer understanding of 
light of truth and the Holy Spirit has more opportunities to to work within us. It, it engages our mind at a formative level, hopefully, yeah. uh, if we can stay calm and diffused and not get uh, wrapped up in passion uh, to the point of abuse. Um, and we can learn and we can be broken down and we can be molded and shaped into the image of Christ, which is what all of us want to do. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I, you know, there's that old uh, Proverbs, was it 27, 17? As iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen the countenance of another. And I've always made the observation, iron sharpening iron is a violent thing and sparks fly. (laughs) And so sometimes, I mean, in respect without sin, it's okay if sparks fly. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's actually, anyone who's been in a healthy marriage is going to tell you sparks are going to fly as we're being sanctified. And so, but the end goal is conformity to Christ likeness. That's cool. Any other thoughts? I, I think one of the, the benefits of conversations like this, besides the informative and the formation uh, components of it, is how it is a display of love within the body when we treat each other with dignity, even if we have opposing or different views on secondary issues. It, it highlights the unity that we have over the core issues or the, or the core tenets of the faith of the gospel. Uh, and it also displays, uh, not just to the church, but hopefully to the outside world, and especially in our society today, of here's a group of people who can have different views and not hate one another for them, but actually mm-hmm. know how to love and respect each other and have good dialogue around them. I think that could be a powerful witness. Amen. Yeah, maybe just, I just was thinking of uh, Jesus's words, you know, that they'll know we're Christians by our love. And mm. and that's that verse is typically taken out of context to, and applied to the world, the way we love the world, but really he's talking about the way we love each other yeah. within the congregation. And so, you know, we're not talking about, you know, universalism here. Oh, it's okay that we all disagree <laughs> about the gospel. Like, no, we, we agree about the gospel. We're talking about secondary issues that, issues that don't, and we'll get into this later, but issues that don't change this, the fundamental nature of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And the way we disagree is importantly, or it's incredibly important. Um, and I think just it shows humility and, mm-hmm. uh, I can usually tell someone that doesn't really know much by how adamantly they argue a particular open-handed issue, right? I'm like, they've probably been in an echo chamber. They've read one person and one person only, and they're very convinced. Um, I find the best theologians are usually the, the quickest to say, I'm not really sure on this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, you've probably studied all the different positions. And so it just shows humility. I think it shows charity. I think it shows the nature of God. Yeah. I was thinking about that thing of love. You know, it's like, is there anything more noble, more powerful, more important than the knowledge of God and responding to that knowledge with worship? And so it's great love for us to open the word of God and discuss the nature of God with brothers and sisters in Christ for the goal of better knowing him, better seeing him so that we can worship him more fully. What a great act of love. What a great way to serve one another, Mm -hmm. to pursue him together in these sorts of even hotly debated conversations. If If the end result is we see God more clearly, and our worship is more informed by who he really is. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, so now we're talking about eschatology. This this, this conversation is about eschatology. Mike, you are the theology professor in our midst um, who teaches eschatology at Pacific Bible College. Um, the question I've, I've, I've presented to you is, what is eschatology, and why is it important to the Christian? Yeah, um, so... I'm going to answer it maybe in a different way because I, I, it's a call to all of us, myself included, uh, and I'll just state that call that we need to recognize ourselves as eschatological people. Hmm. We are an eschatological community. And so I'm going to start at the beginning of the Bible. And th- the reason we have the Bible is it's revelation, right? Which is another way of saying uh, God is revealing himself to us, which the book of Revelation does with a certain genre of, of literature, right? Apocalyptic literature, but it's still revelation. And, and we learn in Ephesians that the person of Jesus Christ was agreeable to the plan of the Father and the Spirit to become the vehicle for creating this entity of which we are now, the church. And this was decided before God said, let there be light. This was before Genesis 1.1. And so from the beginning of Genesis 1-1 all the way through the Bible, God progressively, and I will say progressively is important to note, uh, reveals himself. And he reveals himself through historical human activities. And he, uh, the, the one thing that makes the Bible different than any other human penned book is prophecy. God says, this is going to happen 
and then he so he prophesies it. Then he sovereignly uh, manipulates everything or maneuvers everything to make it happen, and then he interprets it for us. Hmm. And he gives us all of that in the scripture. So he removes our brokenness in the process and reveals himself, but he also reveals his plan. And from Genesis 1 on to Revelation 22, he's working the exact same plan. The plan doesn't change. And that plan is to, to have a people that he can be the God, the king of, they will be his people, and they will live under his reign, and they will exercise his image in the physical realm. That's from Genesis 1 on, that's the plan. It takes different forms. It takes a form in the first 11 chapters. It takes a form in, from Genesis 12 on under the Abrahamic covenant. Um, and then it ultimately it's best revealed, fully revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. But it's the same plan. Yeah. And so what we as uh, Christians often get caught up with is uh, Jesus is... I'm adding Jesus to my life, right? Mm. Um, we learn... Uh, we're, we're actually told by pastors, I've said it myself, ask Jesus into your heart. Well, that's, that's nothing wrong with that, but it contextualizes it incorrectly from a biblical perspective. What did Jesus say? He said, come follow me. Yeah. We need to turn and follow where Jesus is going because Jesus is fulfilling the plan that God wants the Father wants to have accomplished, and that's his, that's his primary task. So we, in accepting and following Jesus Christ, are now a part of that eschatological community that, that exists because Jesus, in a sense, is the kingdom of God. And so it's a different text or a different context for how to yeah. look at eschatology, because right now in, in February 15th, 2024, we are living in the eschaton. Yeah. Uh, if you think about Daniel, well, for Daniel... We're 2,500 years away. It was way in the future for Daniel. Yeah. So it would have been eschatological for him the way we think of it. We think of eschatologically as the Olivet Discourse and Revelation and um, how we look at the millennium. There's a lot to it that we live right now. We, we have eternal life as of right now. We have been baptized into Jesus. We already are at resurrected. So... We just have to contextualize our personal faith and our communities to understand it's a much bigger deal, yeah. and it has much more day-to-day -day real uh, impressions upon us to live as an eschatological person, to think eschatologically. So what does it look like, really quick? So just paint four sentences, Mike. I'm a believer, and I'm thinking eschatologically today. What does that look like manifested in my heart, my inner world, my outer world? I'm, I'm living eschatologically with that vision. What does that, how does that manifest in the life of a Christian? Well, I, the way I would say it is, I, I, if you are a, a, a person walking with the Lord and, and, and in relationship with Him, you're going to have God moments, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you'll know those God moments, and we have them every day. And whether it's through direct, whether it's through another person, whether it's through a podcast, whatever it is, the Holy Spirit's going to touch us. Well, that's an eschatological moment. Hmm. It's we 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 have to realize our personal relationship is wrapped up in God's plan for all of the universe. I love that we're caught up into that grand. Story. We are we are grafted in, or yeah. we are pulled into it. It's not like Christ comes into our life. We are pulled into His. Yeah, that's awesome. What would you and guys that's, a, that's a transformational perspective. Yeah, so it goes from a me-centered worldview to a God-centered worldview. Yeah, and it contextualizes everything in your life around that versus our brokenness yeah. and how we see reality. And that, that informs differently the, the painful moments of right now. The painful moments of right now are nothing in comparison to the eternal plan of God of which I've been bought into through the blood of Jesus. Yeah, and we share in, in we're, we're, the suffering we, we go through is... is part of what God put Jesus through. We share in his yeah. sufferings. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, through eschatology, we realize that God's been, re been um, uh, answering and fulfilling prophecy since the beginning, and he's got all of these open prophecies left. It's, again, the Olivet Discourse and Revelation. But we have hundreds and hundreds of prophecies he's already fulfilled. So as his sons and daughters... We know he's capable, he's competent, and he will get it done. Yeah. And so 
it, it gives us confidence, it gives us maturity, it gives us peace, it gives us unity, mm-hmm. uh, it gives us the ability to love because we don't personalize everything. We realize we're in a war. We're in, it's, it's Satan and Jesus, that's the real war. It's not the Republicans and the Democrats or, or this person versus that person. It's the, the kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness, and we're on the, the front lines for the kingdom of light. Yeah. Amen. I think I would add to that. It's super good. Um, I think a lot of times people hear the word eschatology, they associate that with kind of a negative overtone because the word mm-hmm. eschaton, right, is the end and the study of eschatology, the study of the end, right, or the end things. Um, but I think it's not so much the end as much as it is the end of an age and in, in the beginning of the next age, the eternal age. And, and that actually gives it a much more optimistic Hmm. sense we're not we're not just interacting with well how's everything going to end it's even the word apocalypse right is misunderstood people think apocalypse that means like massive earthquakes and stuff the word apocalypse comes from apocalypsis which is just revealing the revelation the book of revelation is just a revealing of how god is going to bring in his 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 kingdom full term in full consummation the kingdom is fully going to arrive so yeah we see the end of an age and we're going to talk and interact with about exactly how that might look but at the end uh, at the end of the day, eschatology is how is the next stage, the eternal age, going to kind of come in, and what's that going to look like in the future? You know, that's hopeful. Yeah, that's it's exciting. Hopeful. Yeah, yeah. So to 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 add to that, I think I think that's one hundred percent correct. Um, like Revelation, you know, apocalyptic, it it ends in twenty two with the application being the the prayer of the the saints being, "Come, Lord Jesus, come." Right. So there is supposed to be this this encouragement, this hope, this anticipation of what is to come of the eschaton, not this like dread of it. It's like, no, 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 this is the thing we're actually waiting for. These are the promises that God has made that he's going to fulfill for his covenant people. So we should be eager for it, not necessarily scared of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's Absolutely. awesome. Yeah. Very good, very good. Um, One other yeah. quick Go ahead. quick comment. And uh, there's kind of two different eschatological perspectives that each Christian needs. It's the personal, what happens to Mike when Mike dies. Yep. Yep. And then there's what happens in the eschaton. So uh, there's, we're not going to touch on the first part, but just for the listeners, that's a different discussion, yeah. what happens to us in this life when we die. Yeah, that's good. Mm-hmm. Um, we've, we talk often about being gospel-centered churches. You know, Heritage, we say we're a gospel-centered church. I know you guys say you're a gospel-centered church, Sam. And, you know, we live and exist and rotate around the gospel. Everything we do is informed by the gospel. So if that's true, uh, what is the gospel and why ought we keep it in full view even as we have these sorts of discussions about the end times and eschatology? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think the best way to think about the gospel is in the, in the word gospel. It's, it's literally euangelion, which is um, it's a declaration of news. It's good news. It was a Roman... Um, I think it was a Roman uh, word that was adopted by the church and kind of reused to to say there's a declaration like the a euangelion would be a message of typically a new administration or a new king or a victory in a war or something like that. So Christians kind of use, use that to say, hey, we have a new thing happening here, and that is that the kingdom of God is is at hand, um, at least in, in 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 a whole new phase of God's redemptive program. I mean, the kingdom of God has been a reality since. Um, since the garden, but it's been developing in God's re- de- redemptive program. And, as, and, and then when, when, when Christ comes into this world, uh, I think the best way to think about the gospel is to think about Jesus as the seed. Uh, mm-hmm. He said, uh, you know, a seed must first go into the ground and die, and then it brings forth great life. So that was kind of Jesus's way of explaining the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God was going to start with his life first dying, um, and not just to die, but to atone for, the, for sins, to to, to make atonement, to, um, uh, to um, put death to death. Uh, and then he, he becomes the seed of the new, the new genesis, if you will, of an entirely new world. So that's, that's the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus has come in, became a new Adam, died the perfect death, lived the perfect life, was reborn, uh, resurrected, um, in, in he becomes the first fruits. I think Paul talks about the first fruits, meaning he becomes the... the the first of many that will line up behind him. Um, so Jesus got a new resurrected body, which means we're going to get a new resurrected body, which means that the world is going to get a new resurrected body. Hmm. And when we get to Revelation 21, 22, we see a new physical heavens and earth. Mm-hmm. So the gospel isn't we get to leave this earth and go float 
in spiritual land, the, the gospel is we actually get to inhabit a new heavens and a new earth because Jesus' resurrected life set the program trajectory for the rest of God's divine work and redemptive work. So we're, we're in the middle of Christ's two advents. The good news is that Jesus has come, but the good news also is that Jesus is coming to consummate or to finish what he has purchased or inaugurated, to use mm -hmm. the theological terminology. So Jesus has come and Jesus is coming. Now eschatology matters because eschatology is the whole second half of how the gospel is going to, to play out, right? The, that Jesus uh, is coming back to finish what he started on the cross. I'm going to defer to, to this week's text that we're preaching in that. Uh, I think the gospel is right here in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. The angel Gabriel tells Daniel, 70 weeks or 77s are decreed about your people and your holy city. Now, this is all future for, for Daniel. To finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness or rightness, to seal both vision and profit and to anoint a most holy place. That's mm -hmm. a sixfold way of, con of considering the gospel and what, uh, what happened when Jesus came. But some of those things you might notice haven't fully happened yet. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're, we're between the two advents of Christ waiting for what Jesus purchased or inaugurated to be fully consummated. And, and that's the gospel. The good news is that this new kingdom is breaking in, will break in, um, and, and ultimately is going to consume the whole earth. Yeah. Just to add to that is, it is rightfully so. We, we talk about the gospel, preach the gospel of, of Christ's death and resurrection as the the center the 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 central uh, gravity of the gospel but if we don't have this this eschaton if we don't have the consummation of the kingdom it's not a complete gospel yet right yeah and so so just exactly. to 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 not think of of the consummation is to miss part of the gospel that yeah. is essential to it yeah like it, you know a lot of times we stop short in our gospel message we stop short of eschatology yes, we say absolutely hey you know we, we preach a message as we should of forgiveness of sins mm -hmm. and and, but what that, that says is, okay, my sin's forgiven, but what about the sins I'm going to commit? Or what about the fact that this world is still broken? And what about the fact that my body is dying? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the gospel of the New Testament concludes with a rebirth, a resurrection of the whole cosmos. Yeah. Right. And we get new bodies and happily ever after, right? In that, in that sense. And, and so the gospel has to include eschatology. If it doesn't include eschatology, I would actually argue it's not the gospel. Well, so would Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. He'd be like, we're, we're foolish. We're idiots if we don't have this part yeah. of, our, of, of the gospel. Totally. Yeah. Would you guys add anything else when it comes to the centrality of the gospel as we talk about eschatology? Yeah, I would just reiterate what's been said. I, it, that's why Jesus came. He, he yeah. came to create a new people. I mean, mm -hmm. Sam said it well. Yeah. Yeah. He's the new Adam. And, and yeah. God's plan from the beginning was to create this entity called the church. And Galatians 3 talks about in the Old Testament, the, the, the people of God were children. And so they had a law. And now with Christ, we are adults and we are adopted as sons and daughters. So not only is it affecting us, God sees us as adults in the people of God. So we're, we're at a higher level. We're at a more mature level. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. And we're going somewhere. Yeah. This isn't a static thing. Yeah. We have an end. We have a purpose. We have a direction. It's teleological. So just... Yeah. I, I don't have anything to add, but I have a, a question that might bring, begin to start to bring some, some clarity, and that is... You know, I made the comment earlier, like, well, we all agree on the gospel, but we might disagree on some of our eschatology. At what point can eschatology actually depart from the gospel? And in other words, like what, you know, I'll put it this way, what parts of our eschatology are essential to orthodox and understanding of what the gospel actually is? Yeah. When, 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 like at what point in our eschatology are we actually leaving yeah. Christianity? Well, Mike, I think you should start uh, by sharing, you know, how you said before the conversation of these two points. I think that would be helpful to, to frame this question, too. Yeah. So when I teach this class, uh, I have a whiteboard and on, on the left hand side, I will draw the cross. And that cross represents the person and work of Jesus Christ as a human from his his uh, virgin birth through his resurrection mm -hmm. and ascension. And then on the far right, I will have basically a line and it will have uh, the lake of fire and it will have uh, the new heavens and the new earth. So those are the goalposts, if you were. Those are the endpoints of which we're talking about from a New Testament perspective. 
the three primary or four primary pathways that, that we're going to talk about and Dave's going to share a little bit about are just pathways to get from the cross to the new heavens and the new earth. That's the goal. That's the goal of God. It's been the goal of God all along. Uh, we can choose which path we're going to get to, but everybody agrees on where we start and everybody agrees on where we're going to end up. And how we get there is the question that we're going to be discussing or that we are discussing. But it's the same God. It's the same gospel. It's the same endpoints. Uh, and in I think, I think Sam, you had said it, it. These are secondary issues. But I also want to say, and, and for David and I, there's a lot of really smart people that have spent two millennia yeah. Studying this, yeah, exactly. And and these three, we'll knock four, it out this morning. <laughs> yes, these three or four ways, really three ways, are what we have come up with, right? As humans, and so you have to trust the Holy Spirit. We know the Word is is God's revelation, so trust it. And and in what you choose, how you, what path you choose is not going to de defer you or deter you from getting there. Yeah, right. We're so, all going to get there. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, we're all going to get there. So like with those, uh, with those endpoints, right, uh, of Jesus Christ, death and resurrection, and consummation at some point, uh, those two things I think are obviously essential. Like if you deviate from those, you're, you're clearly outside of orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the, the paths as much uh, are, are what we've uh, or will be talking about is reason to accuse a brother or sister of being outside of orthodoxy. I think what you see in the New Testament a lot that falls out of orthodoxy is, is this idea that Jesus has already returned in some way or that he's not physically returning. Like those seem to be the issues that, mm. that Paul specifically has to uh, talk to. So those would certainly be outside of orthodoxy. If you don't think that Jesus is, is going to physically return and, and bring his kingdom in full, um, or if you somehow think that Jesus has already those would be outside of orthodoxy okay. in my understanding. So would that would that would it be fair <coughs> to say then, just for everybody listening, that if we're driving on a road and and, and that's those are the ditches, yeah. everything that's fair game is is there a tribulation? Or if there is a tribulation, is there a pre trib rapture? Is there a rapture? I think everyone agrees there's some kind of a we're gonna meet him in the clouds, but is there pre trib, mid trib, post trib? Let's argue about it. It's all fine. Is there a millennium? Is the millennium an idea? Like all of that stuff, just to be clear, none of that changes or tampers with the fundamental or the foundation of what the gospel is as good news, right? None of that would tamper with that. No. no I would say, yeah, I would I say mean, no. Yeah. Okay. No. Revelation 21 is where we all start to agree. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, Jesus that's where, they all, that's where all the, the views come back together, right? Yeah. The right. great white throne judgment. I mean, that's that's where everything comes back together. Yeah, I was thinking about, you talked about where... where what are some of the areas where we can diverge from gospel? Like this is very functionally. I think sometimes we can become so hyper obsessed with the study of eschatology. We get down YouTube wormholes, rabbit holes, uh, reading every single book we can, seeing the Antichrist behind every rock. And we get so obsessed with that we, that we forget to live as the people of God. So in a functional sense, I think just we can depart from the gospel if, if we are so hyper-focused and obsessed with this unique little slice of, of theology that we forget to share Christ, to be Christ, to be the church, to love one another, and we're just obsessed with news headlines, what's next. I think in a functional way we depart from the gospel and how we live, if that becomes descriptive of us. I think to add to that, I think we all, myself included, have the tendency to take our eyes off Jesus and really focus on whether it's doctrine or whether it's a person or whether whatever it is, we, we want to argue. We like to argue. We're rebellious people. <laughs> and and we just, we just want to promote this idea. And it really doesn't have anything to do with, our, with the person and work of Christ. Yeah. But we, we substitute it. And that person, that, that belief, that doctrine, that dogma that we want to fight for, becomes our God yeah. and it becomes to the point of idolatry and we got to correct ourselves and get focused back on Jesus because he's the one we're following him and he's doing the work. We are, our, our, our challenge is to be abiding in him. That's yeah. what God asks us to do. Yeah. Abide. And, and it's when you boil it down to that, it's pretty simple. Yeah. I had a, I had a brother one time I was talking to him 
and I'll spare you the details, but there was a dogma, an issue of dogma uh, that I was harping on at this season in my life as a Christian. And like, I kept coming back to this. It wasn't a gospel issue necessarily. And he said to me, he said, well, that's your gospel. Mm. Was, I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, that's all you talk about, bro. You're not talking about, and that's, that's become your gospel. That's the message you lead with. And I was like, oh, mm. that really stings. Mm. Yeah. When you make something that's not gospel, gospel, because that's the message we share. Yep. That's how we depart from the gospel. Yeah, like what's the good news for yeah. you? Is it that we're going to maybe escape seven years of tribulation? Yeah. And, and I think for some Christians, like, and I think it's totally okay to be convinced and convicted about a pre-tribulation rapture or whatever. Yeah. But for many evangelists, that seems to be what they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, that, that just doesn't seem like that should be the crux of your good news. Yeah. Hey, guess what? You don't have to go through seven years of tribulation because you know, you're going to be raptured. Like, I hope so. I hope so. If that, <laughs> but that's not the good news of the gospel, right? Yeah. yeah. It is also <laughs> interesting. This is getting off topic and into the weeds, but like, even with that mindset, it's like, that's such an American mindset, right? Where it's like, cause we do live very comfortable lives by, by and large. Right. And so it's like, you go to other places in the world and to like, try and tell somebody like, Oh, you won't have to go through seven years of tribulation. They're like, yeah, life's really hard right now. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, like yeah, what, about what, now? what about right now? And, and I think that's part of the reason that keeping the bigger picture of eschatology as encouraging faithfulness now because of God's present and ultimate future reign needs to be, regardless of which way we're getting there, needs to be the main thing that we're focusing on. That's right. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier, you and I, Dave, were like, when we read eschatology, the temptation is to look out yes. and try to read the tea yeah. leaves and figure out how yeah. things is gonna ha are gonna happen. But really the, the impetus of eschatology or of prophetic literature in apocalypse is for us to look in mm -hmm. and ask, am I living in faithful hopefulness yep. that the plan of God, the eschaton is gonna unfold as mm -hmm. God says it is. And so we, we kind of get the whole, the whole literature fundamentally wrong if our, if our go-to is to open up the newspaper and try to figure out what's coming next. Mm -hmm. I think, well, two comments. One, I think the, the John or Revelation 1 is designed that way because what does it do? It gives us a current picture mm -hmm. of the reigning Christ, mm -hmm. and it's mind-blowing. Yeah. It is mind-blowing, and that's who we who our king is right now. Yeah. That's, that's the Lord right now as he sits in heaven. And then secondly, again, back to the class I teach, there's two, there's, there's two uh, ditches. There's eschatophobia, which is fear yep. of eschat eschatology, and eschatomania, mm -hmm. which is when it becomes mm -hmm. the God, when it becomes the good news and the gospel. And we, we don't, those are the two boundaries we have to stay away from. That's good. Because we certainly can't fear it. Yeah. And that's just as bad as being overly zealous yeah. or, or that's who all you care about is yeah. reading the tea leaves and watching uh, the latest news program about Israel and the Middle East and everything and, yeah. and trying to decipher it against all the, the prophecies. Man, if we stop right now, this is a helpful conversation. Sincerely, a helpful conversation. We're but gonna, let's dive into the list. Yeah, but we got like but th now we, three more pages. <laughs> but, now we, but now we got to get into some of the nerd talk, right? We're going to start talking about some specific things. Mike, you were very wise earlier. You said, hey, I want to make sure that we don't get so in the weeds that we forget to just be pastoral to our people. So we're going to that with our mind on being pastoral to our people, but also recognizing this is a discussion about eschatology, knowing that there are these three or four paths that get us from, you know, inauguration to consummation. Dave, Walk us through briefly. What are the main ideas about eschatological camps that get us from inauguration to consummation? Yeah, so as we said before, um, all of these would fall into the, the realm of orthodoxy. So, so let me start there. Um, there's, there's these three uh, camps. One of them we're going to split actually into two to make four camps, uh, all dealing around the millennium, uh, the millennial reign being uh, mentioned in Revelation 20. And so the question is, when does the millennium take place? Uh, so the first view you have is what we would call a post-millennium view, which means that uh, Jesus is going to be returning and bring in the full consummation after this millennial reign. And so the church uh, currently 
is bringing in the millennial reign progressively as the gospel continues to spread to the nations. Um, so as the gospel goes out, as it is received, as the world begins to live um, within the church and outside the church, more under what we would say is like kingdom values, uh, at a certain point that reaches a level that it's like, okay, the, the kingdom is, is here in a physical, tangible way, and then Christ would return. Uh, so that's post-millennialism. Um, one of the, the advantages of, of this view, it's not as popular as the other uh, views, uh, at least not in the States. Um, it's becoming a little bit more popular, uh, the Doug Wilsons, that kind of camp. It's becoming a little bit more popular again. Uh, one of the, the advantages, though, uh, that should be uh, taken by anybody in any of the camps is the activist nature that this causes in churches and in believers, right? Because they think they are, uh, by, by preaching the gospel, by telling their, their friends and neighbors about the gospel, by being involved in their communities, uh, by being involved in school boards and all this other stuff, that they're actually going to help bring in Jesus's reign. Uh, even if you don't hold that you're bringing in Jesus's reign by doing that, that that activism is a really good thing for us as Christians, uh, not to just get into our little huddles, but to actually go tell people about Jesus and make your communities a better place that reflect kingdom values. That's cool. Uh, is there anything else that you guys... Um, I was going to just say, you know, to their credit, and I'm not post-millennial, but I think to their credit, they take passages like Jesus gave on the kingdom of God when he talked about the seed, for instance, yep. you know, the seed of the gospel, um, which is his life is going to start small and it's going to grow. That's the whole point. And then the the leaven in the in the lump it starts small. The whole point is it works its way throughout the whole. So they so they take that literally uh, and go, man, the gospel is just going to grow and grow and grow, and to the point where it's going to overtake the whole world and usher in some kind of a millennial type reign. And this was actually what the a lot of um, you know Jonathan Edwards and some of these reformers believe because yeah. they they lived at a time where there was mass revival and there yeah. was this expansion of the gospel. Um, and then I think after maybe World War II and a few things, you know, we started to <laughs> kind of go, hmm, yeah. maybe, maybe that's not, and maybe you're going to talk about this too, but I think it's worth mentioning that like in that camp, they see the tribulation as not being something happening in the future, but something that has um, the tribulation as we see in revelation as having taken place in the first century. Yeah. Would you guys, clarify that so, so they, they you know they they see that as already okay now we're just waiting for the return of christ in one shot but the kingdom or the millennial kingdom is something that uh, or the millennial reign is something we're kind of bringing in just to just to, to, to add that yeah and so uh and again there's always going to be uh anybody in these camps not everybody's going to be like universal in their belief right so there's going to be different offsets and whatnot uh so yeah so trib has already happened uh at the same time for the post-millennial view and, and please correct me if i'm wrong here mike that there still will be uh, uh an apostasy towards the end uh and an antichrist i'm i'm pretty sure that post-millennial still hold that uh i'm not sure but i do know and not again, like you just said, not everybody believes this, but in general, post millennialists are what's called preterists. Yeah. Right. So they will look at like the Olivet Discourse and a large section of Revelation as already having happened in first century AD, culminating in the fall of Jerusalem yeah. and us already living in the kingdom. Yeah. So we, the kingdom is here now and it's in its full form and it's just going to continue to, as you said, grow and mature and take over human experience and creation ultimately being culminated uh, at a, there's a tipping point where only God knows where the kingdom is being fully realized because of the expansion of the gospel. And then it terminates with the new heavens and the new earth. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. That's a good question, Dave. I, 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 I'm not sure about if the, the great falling away or the great apostasy. I'm not sure if that's a, a tenant of post-millennialism. I haven't heard it linked to it, Yeah, but that isn't. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, so for the for the just point of clarification too, when Mike says preterist, that just means past. That's yeah. all that means. Yeah. Right? So so the preterists believe that um, Revelation, you know, up until chapter 20, basically is past. That's yeah. already happened. It was future for 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 the original audience, but past for us. Um, so that's just what preterist means. Um, in case anybody's wondering, yeah, 80, not predator, came. not predatorist. That's that's a movie with. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, anyways. Definitely worth going back to. It holds up. <laughs> <laughs> Two future governors in that movie, by the way. Who's the other Jesse one? Jesse Ventura and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, all right. Very well, interesting little bit of... Sorry, we 
What, what about amillennialism, Dave? <laughs> uh, well, let's do let's do premillennialism okay, okay, first. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so premillennialism, if if post is Jesus's physical return coming after the kingdom, premillennialism is Jesus's r- physical return is coming before the millennial kingdom, and it's actually inaugurating it. So in this view, it is a literal uh, a physical kingdom that is here on earth. Uh, that will happen for uh, a thousand years. Um, And there's two ways that that this kind of breaks off. Uh, The dispensationalist view uh, separates Israel and the church very distinctly. Uh, The historical view of premillennialism does not uh, draw that distinction. Uh, It kind of throws the people of God in as one. So you'll get a little different flavors that way. Uh, Some of the advantages of this view uh, is it, it takes a, a literal uh, interpretation of a lot of, of prophecy. Um, it, it's trying to read the text on what is the, the kind of plain meaning of it. Uh, there's the advantage that it, it does create uh, a lot of focus on the es- eschaton. Like it, it does create in people, uh, to Mike's point earlier, of, of having a view as a community as we are an eschatological community. Now, sometimes I can steer off into to those other things that you mentioned of the, the mania or the phobia, but the, the disposition of, of thinking of ourselves uh, through that lens is good. Yeah. Any other thoughts on For those listening, you know, if they're kind of wondering, okay, who are these people that believe that? Um, you know, it's, it's a, there's a lot of people that believe that, especially the, the, um, the um, pre-millennial dispensational camp, like if you've watched the Left Behind movies, largely that, that kind of framework that a literal seven-year tribulation is coming with a three-and-a-half-year, uh, you know, they, they, they divide it that way, literal thousand-year reign, all of that. Um, if you've, you know, anybody that Dallas Seminary, right, teaches dispensational, uh, guys like John MacArthur, Calvary Chapel, if you came from, from Applegate Christian Fellowship, you were taught dispensational eschatology. Yep. Um, not maybe not as hardcore as some dispensationalists, but very much, you know, the kingdom is about the kingdom of the millennial reign is about ethnic Israel and the physical land of ethnic Israel. And so that's why in those communities there tends to be a huge emphasis on Israel and on the 1948, uh, them becoming becoming uh, a nation again. It all centers around the geography and the ethnicity. Of Israel, and, and and they that's how they read eschatology. So probably a lot of people listening to this have been taught a form of dispensational eschatology. Just in case you're wondering what that kind of camp is, yeah, and it's very very pervasive in Southern Oregon. It was interesting when I moved here from Wisconsin. Uh, certainly, premillennialism is is throughout evangelicalism, but like a really strong focus on dispensational premillennialism was more established in Southern Oregon than it by in a considerable amount than it was in the Upper Midwest where I lived before. That's not a bad thing. It's just something I noticed. And that word, that word, by the way, <laughs> I'm just like trying to think, how do I translate some of this yeah, stuff for people? Yeah. Are like, dispensationalism. Yeah. And you can Google that, but, but it's based on the idea that God is working in these things called dispensations in that, or economies that God works differently at different times. And so they see a dispensation to come, which is the millennial reign, where God is going to reestablish ethnic Israel, geographical Israel, and they see a real sharp distinction between the church. The church is raptured out. And then, you know, for that seven year period, I'm probably not super good at explaining it, but that's where they get the, the dispensational idea is that, that there's these specific pieces of time economies that God works in. Yeah. And uh, something you mentioned uh, that is, is worth following up on, too, in the dispensational view, uh, the, the prophecies concerning the land uh, um, in, in the Old Testament, those are fulfilled then in the millennial reign. Yes. Um, which is a very uh, key point to, to this view, right. um, where where other camps might see those prophecies fulfilled uh, in the church or in the new heavens and the new earth. The the dispensational premillennial view is going to see those prophecies directed towards Israel, uh, fulfilled when Israel in the millennial reign is yeah. is uh, uh, in that land yep. and is uh, ruled by Christ. The dirt matters, and that's why everyone's watching the Middle East in yeah. that particular camp, right? Because right. Whatever happens in the Middle East is going to set off or trigger. They're waiting. Are the are the Jews going to rebuild the temple? Mm-hmm. All of that stuff for them. I mean, 1948 for the dispensationalists was like, oh my goodness, like Israel got brought back. This is all fulfillment of prophecy. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's that's the view. And that's yep. why all that stuff is. So that's why they have those prophecy updates and all that kind of stuff that they're super tuned in and all that. Yeah. Um, the millennial reign, literal thousand, historical premill, are they... 
are all historical premill people literal thousand years or can they be figurative thousand years? they can be figurative as, as, as well okay. they don't okay. they don't hold to it exactly uh, as a literal 1000 okay but mike that's that's your camp so why don't you speak into it a little bit more uh on historical premill or just yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay whichever you want to so uh, <laughs> so i'll give you my, my my personal testimony here so i was raised a lutheran so the, the the church that i was raised in didn't really talk about eschatology but knowing what I know now, they would have been in the all millennial camp. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to a fellowships church and was taught dispensational. And I went to a seminary that was taught dispensational. Uh, but now I'm a historical pre-mill pre pre position. So I've talked to uh, some of the, the really high level pastors in the valley, as well as some of the academic people. And you read some of these great theologians of the past and they all say, as they get older, they get more mature, they get a little bit less zealous about mm. the theory or the, the position that they hold, and they, they continue. It's not a set theological position, it's a dynamic theological position. And I think as you get closer to your physical death, God works in you, and I think as you understand God, more your theolo theology is going to change. So uh, one thing I want to mention to people is what you believe today is probably not going to believe what you're going to believe uh, next year. And Paul, you had talked about it. And I'm the same way. Every time I teach theology or eschatology, I come away a little different. Mm. <laughs> and, yeah. and so I, I want to offer that pastorally. I also want to have, offer this. If there's ever a study you're going to do that Satan is going to attack, it's mm. going to be about the end times. And it's because for obvious reasons, he's going to lose. And he wants to keep you from understanding the goal because of all of the motivation it has, because of how much glory it brings to God, because it, it, his purpose is not to gain you. His purpose is to destroy God's plan. Mm. And so if he can short circuit your study, he's accomplishing that. So I just want to exhort you guys, approach any topic, anytime you're reading Revelation or these things, be bathed in prayer and and be prepared yeah the, yeah the theologians i love and respect who i admire um who've been at it a long time have such humility when they come to this discussion about eschatology and it's like what a great way to model that like if anybody could have a hard position like you know the languages you've been studying this for 40 years you have a phd in this stuff and yet you humbly hold it, hold it with open hands it's like okay if that guy is going to hold it with open hands i think i need to hold it with open yeah. hands I, I think uh in the in line of of humility like here's a hum, humble disposition we should all take when we die our theology is going to change some <laughs> like <laughs> we're, we're all going to be corrected in some way shape or form That's when cute. we get there nobody's got it perfectly right here yeah. nobody's got the perfect bracket yeah. so so just carry that into these conversations the perfect example of that is just to think about the eschatology of the old testament saints and, yeah that's a great you know, point my eschatology is i mean the future things they were trying to figure out who the messiah was and they got all these different references. They got Isaiah 53, where the, the, the suffering servant, what's with this, is cut off for our iniquity, like by yeah. stripes real. Then you got all this like stuff about king, prince, Davidic, enthroned, messianic, like militaristic stuff. The, I mean, at one point they had, maybe it's six or seven different people. We don't know, you know? And then it turns out it's one, one person, yep. two advents, two arrivals. It's, it's the two horizons thing, you know, that, that looks like one mountain. You get closer, it turns out that it's two. And so just look at how confused they really were mm -hmm. and then just assume that we're probably similarly as confused about the second return of, or the second advent of Christ as they were about the first. Yeah, that's yeah. a great point. Yeah. And even, you know, post-resurrection, the disciples, Acts 1, like, hey, we're doing it now. And Jesus is like, no, guys. No. <laughs> like, oh, come on. You're, yeah, poor Jesus. Well, and just to follow up on, I think we can take confidence um, because God... The, the, the Bible and his revelation is dynamic, and the Holy Spirit is going to reveal to whoever that generation is the signs. And we haven't, I don't know if we're going to talk about the signs and mm -hmm. the imminency and all that, but, but it's a bit of a contrast, and it's a bit of a contrast on purpose. But I personally believe that the people that are going to be there will know. And they, it doesn't really matter right. what theology they're going to have or what the position they're going to have, they're going to realize, okay. Yes. It's getting close. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. I think because the Holy Spirit is going to... I think of Ephesians 5, and what does it talk about? It talks about Christ washing 
his bride in preparation for the marriage. Well, mm. this is what we're talking about. And, and if we believe that he's washing us through the Bible and through pastoring and through preaching, and then we will know we're being uh, progressively uh, brought along by the Spirit and the, and the Word to the position that we need to be for the bride. Absolutely. Mm. And, and being somebody that I, I think I do sit in a futurist camp where I, I do see these things in the Olivet and to some degree in a revelation and, and Daniel's as, as being future. I think that they are sealed up. They have benefit for us now, but they will have more benefit for, I believe that that terminal generation that's still like just, I just referenced Daniel eight where he's given this vision that was fulfilled in the time past. We are preterists when it comes to Daniel eight, it was stuff about the Greeks and Alexander the great and the, the Antiochus epiphanies and all this stuff. And we can see how it was all revealed, but what, um, what was told to Daniel was that the, the vision of this evenings and the mornings, this is uh, Daniel eight twenty six, uh, has been told is true, but seal up the vision for it refers to many days for now. Mm-hmm. And and I see John as being sort of a New Testament equivalent of Daniel and that they they were both called to seal up things that weren't entirely for their generation. That doesn't mean Revelation doesn't have immediate application to the first century audience, but it means that that to your point, Mike, I think there's a generation coming that's going to pull that stuff out. And it's going to have much more clear clarity for them uh, that God was caring for his future people by setting aside documents for them that they can pull out when they need them. So we got post mill, pre mill dispensational, pre mill historical, and there's a fourth camp. Yeah. So the fourth camp would be a millennial, uh, which sees the uh, the millennial reign that is depicted in, in Revelation 20. Uh, as being symbolic of of the church reign currently. Uh, And I shouldn't say church reign, I should say Christ reigning uh, over the church, uh, and that right now uh, we are experiencing that. Uh, And eventually Jesus will return uh, in in full to bring the kingdom in full, uh, and that can happen at any moment. We don't know. Uh, It could happen, you know, by the end of this podcast, right? Uh, that would be the all-male position. So it's going to uh, look specifically at this apocalyptic literature a lot more symbolically. Uh, it's not going to try and have a literal understanding of, of every event or person or image that is in apocalyptic. Uh, hence, when you come to this, this image of a millennium reign, uh, the amillennial will say, okay, that is symbolic of the church age uh, presently. Mm-hmm. And then clearly it's been 2000 years. So there's not a literalist interpretation of the, of the yeah. millennium. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So uh, that, that wouldn't certainly uh, not be uh, a, a number that we would see as, as um, uh, literal, but symbolic of, of just this, this long uh, comprehensive reign. Well, let's open up our Bibles to revelation 20, the text, this, this the one place in scripture that mentions specifically the millennial reign. Let's read it. And I would love to hear Mike kind of comment on it from, from the premillennial perspective. How do premillennialists read this text? And then I would love, Dave, since you, you represent the amillennial millennial camp, I'd love for you to then also comment on the same text with your interpretive lens. Does that sound like a plan? Great. All right. Uh, want to go ahead and read, that, read the text for us, Sam? You want to read all of 20 or just one through? Just one through seven. One through oh, six is fine. One, one through yeah. six. Yes, yeah, says, uh, verse one, chapter 20, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones. Seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. 
Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, we could have started in a thousand places or many places in Scripture to start talking about eschatological conviction. We started here in this text because this kind of seems to be one of the center texts when it comes to how people develop eschatological uh, conviction. So, Mike, as a, as a historical premillennial, how do you how do you interpret those words those verses? Yeah, so I'm going to break it into two sections. So the first three, um, uh, let me make an es- an exegetical statement for. So from a historical pre male position or a pre male position, um, we're going to read Revelation linearly in time. So we believe it's sequential. So Revelation 20 happens after Revelation 19 so on and so forth. Revelation 21 happens after Revelation 20. So everything is based on temporal linearity and chronology standpoint. So we would have already had in Revelation 19, Jesus coming and conquering the big war. Yeah. So at that point, after that historical, we're, we're going to look at it as a historical event that actually is going to happen We prepare, if you will, for this thousand-year reign, and this angel comes down, and this language may be somewhat uh, metaphorical, but he is going to bind Satan in a very unique, unprecedented way into some sort of a prison that he is removed from influence in the world. Mm -hmm. And that prepares then for four through seven, where we have uh, thrones, we have Jesus getting ready to take his uh, position and rule in on physical earth in a physical way for a thousand years, which is literal or, or metaphorical, it doesn't really matter, yeah. but it's going to be a physical reign on this earth. And there will be Christians and non-Christians available there, and I don't think we want to get into the minutiae of all that, yeah. but... Uh, it then terminates later on in chapter 20 with uh, Satan being released and the final Armageddon. Yeah. Thank you. That was very succinct and quick. That was awesome. Dave. Yeah, so in, in some ways, here becomes the primary difference. Uh, the amillennial view is not going to understand Revelation sequentially. Um, so they are not going, or we are not going to understand that uh, chapter 19 are, are events that happened before chapter 20. Now, of course, that would seem odd to, uh, again, just the, the normal reader, uh, but the reason for that is, A, it's apocalyptic literature, so so things are just not operating the way that they do in an epistle. Uh, the second big thing is when we look at chapter 19, when we see the, the marriage of the Lamb, uh, and then in verse 11, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, he who sat on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he come and judges and wages war. So we see this as as Christ's second coming, um, and this being the the final. If you read the rest of the chapter, the final battle uh, of Armageddon, we would say, like of of when Jesus comes back and he is judging the nations. Um, now, then, what happens in chapter twenty? Well, again, we're not understanding it sequentially. Uh, so what we would say, the best analogy I've heard is it's a it's like watching the replay uh, in a sporting event. So you're seeing the same play, you're just seeing it now from a different angle because in the replay it's giving you a different camera angle. So in chapter 19, we had the angle that was focusing on the beast and the false prophet in Jesus's return. Now we're having the angle that's going to focus on how he is going to handle the dragon. But it's the same time that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is only coming back that one time. Yeah. Um, the other thing that becomes, uh, then important is like, okay, well, how do we understand this first resurrection? Uh, and again, the amillennial view being happening now, we would understand that as the spiritual resurrection that we all experience as believers, uh, for those of us who are born again, when we put our faith in Christ. And how do you deal with the, uh, Satan being bound and thrown into a bottomless pit? Yes. Not, not, not being allowed to, to influence the nations. Right. And so this is, I think this is. I don't think this is a weaker part of the amillennial view, but I do think this is a necessary question that we have to be able to ask because clearly elsewhere in the New Testament, uh, you know, we we have uh, Satan being uh, uh, still deceiving people, right? So it's mm-hmm. like, so how can we say that? 
and I think the interpretation of understanding uh, Satan is no longer deceiving the nations as a whole, meaning that the Gentiles have been grafted into the covenant people of God. That is what is being referred to here in, in Revelation 20, that the, the Gentiles have, have now had the gospel preached to them and are believing on, in it. Not universally, of course, uh, but there are Gentiles that are entering into the, the family of God. Just just one yeah. more point yeah. on that. So, uh, and I've heard uh, uh, millennialists, uh, I invite them to talk at my classes, and he would say that um, during Jesus's temptation, uh, he, he defeated Satan. And so after that, Satan's power was lessened mm -hmm. uh, until the end times. And so, you know, supporting what, what uh, David is saying, he doesn't have the same level of influence that he did. Yeah, and didn't Jesus say he came to strong to bind the strong man? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So that becomes a, a parallel text as well. Yeah. Yes. Can I? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for ask it. Ask a, a question and, and even just maybe bring some clarity for for everybody listening to. So, so in that in that position, David, if if we see, you know, twenty chapter twenty, the millennial reign as being symbolic for the age we're in now, right? The 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 time where Christ is ruling and reigning. Then then that would mean that everything that we see in really Revelation, what is it four through. 19. So all of that is describing events that happened in the first century. Would you, is that so the preterist position? Is that kind of where you're at on all that stuff or? Um, it would be more of a uh, preterist and idealist, right? Where it's still, it is still occurring, okay. right? Like these, these are definitely still spiritual realities. Like chapter, chapter 12, right? Like uh, the, the dragon is still waging war mm -hmm. uh, against the woman and her children. Okay. So uh, against the church, right? Okay. So like th those are present realities. Those are going to be present realities throughout the life of the church. Okay. Um, and, and, that then becomes our, our our view that certain things have been fulfilled uh, historically, uh, and certain things will be, but most of it is universal throughout the life of the church. So to 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 double click those terms real quick. So preterist again meaning past, idealist was the other word you used there, meaning uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but meaning that this is conveying an idea that recapitulates. Right or or yes. will kind of cro that that the Antichrist isn't so much a figure as much as it is figures that continue to kind of appear. One of them maybe being you know uh, Nero or or Titus or or you know correct is that kind of am I explaining that right? So you say yes, preterist and idealist is kind of like yes, it happened and it's happening. Yes, and I think one of the advantages of this interpretation is uh, Revelation specifically, uh, therefore, is applicable and has a message that is necessary for the church throughout history, uh, not just for that generation in which mm -hmm. these things will be happening. And of course we take this view with all of scripture, w with everything else, like yes, Paul's letters are, are to specific Christians at a specific time in a specific location, but we understand that to be universally, universally applicable to the church throughout time, throughout place. Uh, the amillennial view and how, how we interpret uh, Revelation holds that same view then of how scripture can be used and should be used uh, for the body of Christ throughout time and throughout place. Yeah. And I'm sympathetic to that idea of idealist because I'm teaching Revelation right now. It's, it's clear that there were meant to be more than one fulfillment of some of these things, right? Yes. The, the perfect example is the abomination of desolation. Mm -hmm. like that. Right. It's clearly talking about Antiochus. It does seem like that's also seems to be talking about, you know, their Nero or Titus, or however yep. you read it in the first, and the destruction of the temple. But then I would kind of be like, but I think there's going to be another realization of that. I think there's going to be another, which it sounds like maybe to some degree you think that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I certainly like, you know, again, we're all going to have some eschatology corrected when we get there. Uh, <laughs> and if, if we see the third uh, abomination of desolation, it's just like, yeah, uh, that, that seems to make a lot of sense to me. We used a in a, we use the language trans temporal with our church or trans historical. Yeah, this idea that there are multiple horizons of fulfillment as we look into the future, and we also have used the phrase uh, re recapitulation with our congregation with this idea within historic or within apocalypse that there are different perspectives of the same event and there's recapitulation that's unique to this form of literature as well. So it's cool to hear you talk about it also. Yeah, and uh, there. With that, like we also have Old Testament prophecy that's worked that way, right? Uh, besides, besides this this idea in Daniel, uh, but even thinking uh, in Isaiah, right? Like a child will be born. Like there was a child born in that day when that prophecy is made, right. and then that 
also applies to Christ, right? So there is like plenty of reason to, yeah. to believe that some of dual fulfillment of dual fulfillment, that some prophecies that are made have an immediate fulfillment and then are going to point to a greater fulfillment. Yeah, and I every time we read one of those, again, I think we're we we're called to praise God. He is sovereign. He is he alone is God. To be able to do that uh is hmm. is phenomenal yeah. i mean he really is <laughs> he's in calling control. his shot yeah. yeah he really is in control so it just it's it's awesome when you start really thinking about it theologically yeah. so how is it that the two of you can read the same text have different perspectives and yet not squabble seriously talk with me just a little bit practically about how do we live peaceably in this space as brothers in christ sisters in christ where there's fundamental disagreement on how to interpret a certain text how does how do we live in the same space uh, I'll, t- I'll start. So I, I'll just look at myself and I already kind of mentioned my little five minute history, but my views on, on specifically eschatology have changed dramatically yeah. and my faith has only gotten stronger through it. And I hmm. hold it looser and looser. Uh, I, I like Dave's comment when we die, we're all of our <laughs> eschatology is going to change. <laughs> Um, and again, which death? First death, second death. <laughs> <laughs> easy, easy. But you have to hold it loosely because yeah. I don't think God wants us to know. He doesn't. If we know exactly what's going to happen, uh, we would focus on that and fo- take our eyes off Jesus. Yeah. And and we have to walk in faith. He always these revelations uh, that he has throughout the Bible of prophecy and the fulfillment of them and, and the double prophecy fulfillment, those are all ways that he communicates to us, A, his sovereignty, B, he is exercising his plan, mm-hmm. and we need to focus on him. We should be aware of the times, and, and absolutely, we're, we're commanded to know the times, read the signs, but how this all works out Ultimately, we care about Revelation 21 and 22. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Every, every tear will be wiped from our eyes and make all things yeah. new. Yeah. I love the idealist kind of idea, though, because regardless of who's right on the first part of Revelation, all the tribulation stuff, like, you know, we're, we're seeing things like principle. Like, if I was going to preach Revelation, like, I could, I could just preach the principles without even worrying about the timeline and say, look, God protects his people through tribulation. Mm. Mm-hmm. This was what was encouraging to the original audience when they read it was that God is going to preserve and seal his people. They have his mark. You know, I don't think that's talking about some kind of literal mark of the beast. I mean, if you're a believer, you have the mark of the spirit of God, right. the New Testament circumcision. You are sealed, right? Mm-hmm. It's meant to encourage us that God gets his kids through troubled times and that he is victorious. I mean, these are principles that regardless of the chronology Every Christian can go, man, that's encouraging. You mm-hmm. know? And we've been seeing that in Daniel, right? Like yeah. Daniel has these ghastly visions that God reveals to him of of the the little horn prevailing against the people of God. Like and he's like, Oh, tell me more about that. And but you say, No, wait a second, but the people of God will possess the kingdom. Da- Daniel, right. lift your eyes up. The people of God will prevail. And again and again, God, you know, in his grace reveals that eschatological hope to Daniel in the face of hundreds of years of difficulty that mm-hmm. are facing the people of God. That's good. Yeah. Um, we, we're actually kind of running out of time. I had a lot of other questions I wanted to ask, but I just want to, I'm going to kind of finish with this. Um, we're pastors. Uh, you're a, sh- a shepherd and an elder at Heritage. You're, you're, you're a pastor. Dave, you and I pastor together. I know we, our, our, so we're not just theologians, we're shepherds, we're kind of practitioners. Like if our theology doesn't manifest in the care of people, like we're just a bunch of academic eggheads, right? Let's just speak to that for the last, this last, our last response. Okay, we're talking eschatology. We've got people who are going to listen to this, who are going to sit under preaching on Sunday on Daniel 9, the 70 weeks. Um, speak as a pastor for a few minutes. Like, how do we shepherd our people well in such a time as this with what's going on mm. in Israel, what's going on in the world, political elections coming up, we're, uh, uh, there's a lot of upheaval globally. Just speak as a shepherd for a few minutes in light of this discussion. Not putting words in your mouth, but just sh- shepherd our people. I'll take a shot at that just to get it started. I think, I think that when back to something I said earlier, when when your gospel is as small as just, you know, God loves me and has a wonderful plan for my life and paid for my sin. Not that that's not part of the gospel, but when that's just, when when you don't have an eschatolo- eschatological gospel, I think you are very easily shaken. Mm. Your worship is very small. 
because your scope is very small. And what I love about eschatology is it, 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 zo- it forces us to zoom out and see that God is doing such a big thing. He's doing cosmic things. He's large and in charge. And I mean, Revelation 1, we see Christ. He is high and lifted up the right hand of the Father. He's glowing. He's the high priest. It's incredible, right? And uh, and he's given the scroll, sort of the, you know, the the um, the happenings of of the future of humanity, and it's it's like it just increases, I think, our worship. It increases yeah. our confidence. It increases our size of the, the the way we think about what kind of things God is doing. And so, are there dangers in eschatology? Sure. And are there there are deficiencies that you could get into depending on how you read it? Sure. But like we have to have an eschatological sized gospel mm. that sees that God is wrapping up all things, that there is a scroll of how everything's going to work out and only Christ can open it. And he's got it all figured out and he's, he's going to open it, that his, his redemptive program is going to get us where we need to go. So pastorally speaking, I think read Revelation, read Daniel, read the Olivet and read it through the lens of worship and confidence and trust and let it expand how big you see God in your, in your scope. Yeah, I was just, you talked about, you just use the phrase scroll. I was just studying Daniel 10 this morning. The end of Daniel 10 is, is this angel is speaking to, to, to Daniel. He says, I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. <laughs> and we just started talking as a group this morning as we were studying. What is the book of truth? Like, it's, this, it's the sovereign, perfect will of God that's going to unfold regardless of what the beasts do. Mm. There's a book of truth that exists and, and as we talk about eschatology, we're just reminded that God has this, like he's got yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. good. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, I'm going to say this pastorally, uh, and I will preface it with, uh, I do not think America is an evil nation in the way that sometimes it is talked about. Uh, my father served, my brother served. I have a deep love for America. I'm very thankful to have been born in this country. I'm very proud of this country. We are entering a crazy election season after however many years it's been of the political state that we've been in. Um, As believers, we need to understand that uh, America, like every other world government, at some point is Babylon. Uh, Our goal is not to uh, preserve and fight tooth and nail uh, against the right or against the left, whichever side you think is destroying this country. Um, Who knows? This country might not be what you grew up in or what I grew up in in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 100 years. That's okay because at the end of the day, that's not the kingdom we're fighting for. Um, So if you're exhausting all your energy and you find yourself hating whatever uh, other side there is um, politically in this country and you call yourself a believer, uh, apocalyptic literature should challenge you in that way. Hmm. Uh, it should very much challenge what kingdom you are ultimately given your allegiance to. Uh, it should challenge to, to who are you actually devoted to. And again, I'm very thankful for the American uh, way of life, for our founding principles, uh, for what it stands for. Uh, I hope I get to experience those for the rest of my lifetime on this earth. At the same time, my goal is not to preserve those over everything else. Uh, my goal is to live faithfully to help brothers and sisters in Christ live faithfully, uh, to bring more people into the people of God, because that is the only kingdom that's going to last. Uh, I think that is something in the midst of 2024 and for however many years we live in this political climate in our country that we need to keep reminding our people of. Mm. Amen. Well said. I think for me, um, I want to encourage us to remember uh, and be bold. And throughout all of the Bible, God calls his people, remember, specifically mm-hmm. the Exodus, right? Or these huge events. He, and what is he doing? He's drawing them back to his mighty acts. He's b- drawing them back to give them confidence, to give them faith, to say, I got this. <laughs> uh, I'm in control. Uh, I will save you. I will cover you. I will protect you. And we all are going to have mutual and independent sufferings and, and difficulties, whether it's emotional, whether it's physical, whether it's sickness, whether it's whatever. Uh, but even in those, those times, eschatology helps you gain confidence in the Lord. He's got you, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so that's the one side. The other side is we are to be a part of this program. And, and I go to Ephesians 2. We were created 
to do the good works that he has prepared for us to do. If he's in control of the whole universe in guiding it from Genesis 1 to Genesis, Revelation 22, he also has individual works for each one of us to be doing. Yeah. And for us, the four of us, this hour is what we're called to be doing. Right. And, and we, it blows our mind to think about a God that can do that. But let your mind be blown. Uh, yeah. He's a huge God. <laughs> yeah, I uh, thank you honestly for your wisdom, all three of you guys. Um, it's encouraging for me just to sit under that that encouragement uh, this morning. Um, I'm thinking about the work, right, Mike? I, I'm going back to the Olivet Discourse as Jesus is talking about future things to his disciples. They're sitting on the Mount of Olives, looking at the city that's going to be destroyed in you know 40 years, and he's kind of giving them instruction, you know. And, and he ends all of it discourse with this little. Um, I guess you could call it like a little parable. Um, he says, concerning that day, that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. And then he tells his disciples, be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man, he says, going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and he commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not even know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. And I've reminded that little uh, parable all the time, like, okay, mm. he's gone away. He's ascended you know, in glory. He's coming back. We all believe that's true. And he's given his church a work to do. And we need to stay awake and do that work. The yep. danger with eschatology is that we are, we are, I go back to, I was looking at Acts 1. The, Jesus ascends before the disciples and they're looking up at him. Or as he's talking to them as they're getting ready to ascend, Jesus as he's getting ready to ascend, Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times and the season that the Father is fixed on his own authority. Then the famous phrase, Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So it's very clear when I listen to Jesus speak about what we're to do in this time between his ascension and his, his return, is he's, been, he's given us a work. Yep. And, and, and we're, not to keep our, we're not to speculate on seasons and times. He just says this in Acts 1. Uh, we're to be doing the work, to stay awake, to stay vigilant in doing the gospel work yep. that God has given us to do, to expand his kingdom, to proclaim the gospel. And so that's just my encouragement to anyone who loves eschatology. It's great. Study it. So study it to the end that it allows you or it spurs you on to remain awake yep. and committed to the work that God has given his church to do for today. Amen. So that's what I would share. Amen. It's a good way to end Guys, it. this discussion was awesome. I wish we could do this more often. Thank you for committing your time and sharing your wisdom. And Pastor, thanks, thank you to anyone who actually made it all yeah. the way to the end of this video. Yeah. Love you, Ma. If you're still watching. <laughs> yeah, Ma. Yeah, thanks, Mom. <laughs> no, there are, there are some eschatology nerds who are geeking out on this, I promise. And thank you for sticking it out. It's amazing. Uh, Pastor Sam, would you just close your time in prayer? If they actually stay through the end of my closing prayer, I'm really impressed. <laughs> yeah. usually, oh, closing prayer, I'm out. Father, I'm so thankful that, uh, that you understand how things are going to wrap up. Uh, in this, this age, Lord, we're so thankful that you chose um, graciously to clue us in mm. with some information, um, but we also recognize that we see through a glass dimly, and uh, Lord, that the perfect has not yet come, and that we're waiting, Lord, for your second arrival. Um, and so, Lord, while we wait, uh, as Paul just said so well, we desire to keep oil in our lamps, we desire to pay attention, um, to be ready, to be busy, to be studious, God, um, we desire to to walk by faith, Lord, and know that you are coming. And God, uh, tribulation will certainly come. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether, Lord, that's uh, the tribulation that um, just comes through throughout all of history uh, for all believers, or whether that's a particular period of tribulation, God, we don't know, but we just thank you and that you're going to preserve us through that, mm -hmm. that you're going to seal us through that. Um, God, we look forward to whatever you have for us, whether that's a thousand-year millennial reign on earth in, uh, in, in geographical Israel or whether that's, um, <coughs> whether that's this age that we're in now and we just have uh, future heavens and earth to look forward to. Whatever you have for us, God, we know it's going to be far and above greater than anything we would have thought to ask for. So, God, we trust you and we love you and thank you for these men. And I pray that, that God, the church would be marked by humility and charity and understanding in these open-handed issues. Yes. Uh, Lord, lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks for tuning in.